Well, Fox News political contributor Tammy Bruce, president of Independent Women's Voice and a Washington Times columnist Joe Borelli, New York City Council Minority Whip and a former Trump New York campaign co-chair, and along with Evan Siegfried, author of GOP GPS, president of some uh, consulting. Let me start with you, Evan. Uh, you know, I'm listening to Carol and I'm like, it sounds like a great platform, a reasonable platform, particularly for a city that's kind of grown faster than they anticipated, facing some serious problems, structural and also social. Social. Yeah, I think that infrastructure is something that's great to focus on. The potholes, it may sound trivial to some, and I'm sure there are some on the left who will mock that, but potholes actually do matter. In New York City, we've had mayors who have run on campaigns of f cleaning up potholes and making it better, Rudy Giuliani in particular. We also have seen Rudy Giuliani run on crime and lowering that because New York City was known as the rotting apple. So uh, Ms. Swain, I absolutely back her candidacy. I think that she is right in that we can't have one party rule in one city or one region. I think it's better and we get better ideas when we have both parties able to contribute equally and give the best ideas and merge them together. You know, Joe, we had uh, Mark Zuckerberg today and yesterday acknowledging uh, you know Silicon Valley the sort of atmosphere there and and obviously it would be hostile uh, to, to conservatives uh, and you know it's sort of unnerving because you know to, to Evan's point no matter where you are in a political divide we always used to pride ourselves as a nation of, of having you know competing voices loyal opposition and, and and not destroying the other side and it looks like that's what the case is going to be from here on out and the dirty secret of new york is that we actually had republican mayors for many years in the past uh, two decades and, and the balance of power in new york is what made things pretty successful keeping in mind those potholes that i'll, I'll probably get to next week <laughs> um but, but but it's true you, you look at the bigger picture and i think mark zuckerberg could not be able to lie to the members of congress Congress and try to say that there was no liberal bias on Facebook as a platform. And he struggled to explain his business model uh, as being a, a platform rather than, as he described, the ISPs as a pipeline. He doesn't want Facebook to be treated like a utility, but the public, the people who generate the content, the people who buy the ads, those are the people that treat his platform like a utility. And I think that's that's where the direction the Congress is going. You know, of course, he, uh, the, the exchange with Ted Cruz was really tough, yeah. uh, but it was needed. I was glad he brought it up. And again, uh, the idea that you have 20,000 like-minded folks who all have this hostility toward conservative voices means censorship. Well, it does. And the, the issue becomes not just in what Zuckerberg might be saying today about what he knows and what he's trying to do, but the long-term impact of that being the culture, the, the, this corporate culture in there with the things that will transcend him when he ends up going, the things that come from Facebook, the attitudes that are changed, how that bleeds out into society, what, what you're told is okay and what isn't. Are they trying to affect a, our social right. mindset when they say diamond and silk are d a danger to the community? What does the left do with that? Do they then feel like they've been correct and that that needs to be the new uh, assignation for all conservatives? Th th this is something that Zuckerberg is not going to stop. And this is the kind of thing that we right. do have to have this larger conversation also, about. Also, what is really important is, remember, in December 2017, they, or 2016, they had a huge meeting where Dana Perino, Tucker Carlson, all went over to meet with Silicon Valley's, particularly social media executives, and talk about how they can be more friendly to conservatives. Right. Well, because in 2016, I went. was uh, personally attacked right. and harassed, and it took me writing an article in the Washington Post for Twitter to actually pay attention. All right, guys, we've got to leave it there. Well, apparently they're planning strikes uh, against Syria, and this is putting President Trump, of course, on a collision course of Vladimir Putin. Uh, the president, in fact, painting a very dark picture of the current standing with Russia, tweeting this morning, our relationship with Russia is worse now than it has ever been and that includes the Cold War. There's a, no reason for this. Russia needs us to help with their economy, something that would be very easy to do, and we need all nations to work together. Stop the arms race. Back with me now, Tammy Bruce and Evan Sidfrey. Tammy, um, uh, last week, uh, President Trump leveled sanctions against oligarchs and a lot of companies there. Mm -hmm. uh, the initial reaction was the Russian stock market down 11 percent, the ruble down 8 percent, and mm -hmm. Russia's leading aluminum company maker stock down 50 percent. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's safe to say maybe the bloom is off the rose in this bromance? Well, a, a little bit, but I don't know if it was a particular bromance. The president clearly wants to be able to like everyone. He's even done this with the never-Trumpers here. He wants to be able to get, as a businessman, you want everyone to get along because 
if there's divisions, you don't accomplish what you need to. So he's been trying that. But he's also a realist. He knows what needs to happen at a certain point, and he's going to get it done. I would suggest at the same time that this is a little bit more of a trolling. It is somewhat insulting to Russia, where you've got Donald Trump in the United States saying, you know, you need our help, but this is what's going on. And the new sanctions are important, too. People might not realize that when you sanction individuals like that, it essentially also freezes their assets in the United States. Right, right. And, and so this really, when you've got a very few people controlling massive amounts of money in Russia, when you begin to freeze their assets here, it has a terrific impact. So the president knows what needs to be done, but he's also not going to cut things off at the knees in case, you know, there's a way to move forward. Well, uh, yeah, we call that art of the deal means yeah. the art of war, right, Sun Tzu's. But here's the thing, though, Evan. Um, you know, Russia is a one-trick pony. I mean, outside of energy, they don't really have much of an economy, and their economy has been crushed over the last few years. So they're in an awkward position. What do they risk? What does Vladimir Putin risk? Because he's extraordinarily popular in this country, and this kind of a skirmish may hurt them economically, but he may become even more popular. Well, first of all, I think it's important to point out that the Russian foreign ministry today said that they will not conduct diplomacy via Twitter. But I think they've forgotten what their uh, Russian embassy in the U.S. Twitter account does. It trolls the United States and it likes to make fun of us. So it conducts much worse diplomacy than anything Donald Trump has ever done toward Russia on uh, Twitter. Now, I think that Vladimir Putin sees the world in a Cold War light. When we, the Cold War ended, Americans turned and looked toward inwardly and toward the Middle East and conflicts there and regional conflicts throughout the world. Vladimir Putin and his cronies have looked at the United States as their chief adversary. Mitt Romney called it out in 2012 and Democrats mocked us. Right. And now we are seeing Vladimir Putin trying to. Uh, so what happens? Because President Trump has power. extended the olive branch, uh, at least publicly he has. So where does this go from here? Well, here's what Putin's problem is. For years with Obama, he was able to expand. He got a footprint in the Middle East. He likes that. That's one of the reasons why his approval is high at home. He needs that high approval. Otherwise, there will be riots in the street because the economy is so bad. Right. That's the only thing keeping them down. Trump is ruining all of that with his actions. So it is in Putin's interest to try to uh, persuade Trump to try to be better at it, to not have this, uh, sure. you know, get, get worse so that he will at least uh, quell uh, people at home. Now, how do you so, see it in, in the... Uh, what I see, first of all, is Vladimir Putin is all in on backing Assad, even if it means Assad gassing men, women, and children who are completely innocent. No, he'll back, he'll back out of that if it ends up hurting him. But, he doesn't care about it. Hold on. I think difference. that Donald Trump can actually make this into a win for himself. He has been criticized by some in the center and on the left of being too nice to Vladimir Putin and refusing to criticize him personally and in, uh, in public. So all he has to Twitter. do now is tweet if that he, Vladimir Putin, your mom wears combat boots all, and it's all, actually, all, all, all he has okay. to do now is he comes out and yeah. at a press conference says, listen, I tried the carrot and stick approach. I tried the carrot. I didn't want to say anything right. bad. I wanted to improve relations. It's clearly not working. Here's the stick. Right. And I think uh, Americans would support when, him. When we'll we see. strike we'll Syria see. and there's Russians involved and they get hurt and we win, yeah. that's going to send a very strong message. Well, we'll see. In fact, we're going to discuss that next. President Trump, in fact, weighing several options, including a military strike there. Uh, but there are some here who are saying the best option is America should just walk away.